Oh. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this afternoon session at our Functional Aging Summit. I'm Debbie Pillarella, and I am here with my colleague, Diane, Dr. Diane McCaughey. Our session today is called Group X, Old Methods, New Science. And Diane is going to navigate our slides, and I'm going to just kind of talk at the beginning. So uh, we're going to just give a little overview of what our goal is in this presentation. So as you can see on your screen, we're here to help you understand how we combine fundamental principles of social cognitive theory with evidence-based older adult physical activity research. And again, you've known that if you are certified through FAI, um, we're gonna bring that to the forefront and really show how we integrate these elements so that we can teach you how to create valuable group exercise experiences that stimulate these cognitive and these functional domains. There's six functional domains we're gonna talk about while emphasizing cognition and obviously, and most importantly, fun. Love. So as I said, yeah, thank you, Di. As I said, my name is Debbie Pillarella, and presently I work for a, a large three hospital healthcare system in Northwest Indiana. I'm the director of their bariatric service line, as well as medical fitness, where we hold a number of older adult types of offerings, whether it be small group, one-on-one, -on -one, or group X, which is where we got a lot of our ideas for today. Um, I am also a master trainer for FAI and the American Council on Exercise. And I'm going to let Diane give her introduction. So you guys, this is Dr. Diane McCaughey, my colleague. Thank you. Deb and I have been working together for years. We actually started with the Aerobics and Fitness Association of America many, many years ago. Uh, Deb is in school now, joining our rank, so soon to be called doctor as well. So very Maybe. proud of you. Yes, you will. <laughs> so Deb is more in the medical world. I am down on the ground floor where I am with geriatric patients. My eldest patient who just passed away was 106. Uh, I have eight uh, clients that are in, well into their 90s. I also am a master trainer. Deb and I also sit on the advisory board for FAI and for the American Council on Exercise. So a lot of education and we are so excited to be here. Absolutely. So I'm gonna start talking about more at the high level to begin and then we're gonna kind of really trickle it down to give you very specific things that you can take home and use today, tomorrow or the next day. So we're gonna start by talking about this thing about social cognitive theory. And one of the things that we have learned is that even though group X is fun and it's, you know, engaging and it's just uplifting, you know, there are very key underlying fundamental principles and theories that are embedded as well as contributory to why we do what we do. And so this slide really speaks about what we call the trifecta or the environment, personal and behavioral aspects of social cognitive theory. You know, if we were going to ask you what is one of the most important things why group exercise is alive and thrives, it's because because our participants feel connection, they feel purpose. And even though we have come out of such a very dark, dismal place, look at how we have all beautifully pivoted and still maintained how to be together within a distanced environment. So our environment, our norms, our access to our community, whether it be in person or how we've pivoted to be virtually, really influences each other, right? And, and there's this bi-directionality and you can see from the slide, the arrows that go back and forth because our environment and with which we're working in right now in group access, we're talking about it, affects how our knowledge is, what our expectations are, how our personal attitudes are. Do we have a positive attitude about coming to this experience, right? And then both the environment and the personal elements feed into how we behave. If I feel happy, right? I'm going to feel good about myself. That's called self-efficacy. And then I might be able to perform better and do more because I'm feeling spirited in nature. And so also our behavior, if we don't have good self-efficacy, for example, it might affect our attitude, which then will affect the people that we're with. So can you see this interwovenness of the human behavior and how it's determined by these factors? Okay, so keep that in mind as we move forward. So Di's going to show us the next slide. And we're just going to give you some, we call them like these keywords 
um, to support this cognitive theory. So we're gonna look at a couple of pieces of literature one um, is from Berkman et al. and then Smith and Christakis, who said, you know, many researchers have pursued a better understanding of how these social ties can really impact health and the quality of life of our older adults that we're working with, because we want to view individuals as being rooted in these social networks. Every single one of us has a social network which, which we are involved with as well as we are impacting. Even the researchers Litwin and Wells, they spoke about these social networks and depending on the type and the quality, you know, social networks are in, actually, they can be good or bad, right? They can serve as risk factors. If it's a negative social network where a person isn't feeling good about being in that network, or it could be an uplifting thing to safeguard them and enhance their well being. And that's what Group X and what we're talking about as far as our foundation. Now, if you know anything about your back in your psychology studies, maybe in high school or, or college, the next slide is going to give you uh, information about Albert Bandura. We call him the Papa. He is Papa Bear of social cognitive theory. And his work way back, actually, he started this work in 1986, and then he did do some modifications to his theory. But basically what we want to leave you with from the theory of social cognitive theory is that social cognitive theory or CSCT may be a particularly useful framework so that we can better understand physical activity behavior in our middle and older adults and for developing and designing our programs geared toward initiating and maintaining the physical activity of this population and the importance of the connectedness that social cognitive theory can provide, okay? So big deal, right? You might say, great, Debbie, that's good. Oh, you're studying in school and you must be just spewing off at the, at, the, at the helm here. But honestly, guys and gals, think about it, right? What is Group X? It's socialization. It's the way people can come together whether they're side by side or virtually on a screen. I know that we're mic'd, right, or muted, and when we can't see our video with you at this point, but we know you're there, right? And we know that what we're talking to and talking about is impacting you in some way, shape, or form. So group X, the big deal is that we are being social, and it's a very important element for what we do in addition to our physical activity. So Diane's gonna to talk to you a little bit deeper and how this all kind of plays out. Yeah, and I just wanted before we move on just to tie everything Deb is saying and to tie everything into where we're going. Again, we're not sure what certifications you have. Hopefully you have FAS, maybe you wanna come and get the group X. Not sure if you have the brain health trainer dealing with the cognitive aspect and um, have no idea if you have any coaching experience. Deb and I also teach the behavior change for the American Council on Exercise. Extremely important, Ryan Glatt in cognition also believes that behavior change is a piece of cognition. They have to go hand in hand. So when you look at that social cognitive theory, not only where they are today in their groups, what was their childhood like? What are their belief systems? What kind of thinking do they have? Because remember, your feelings and your thoughts create your emotions. Your emotions create your actions and your actions create your outcomes. An example is I have a woman, I say that she has stinking thinking. She's had it from childhood. And when she has all these issues and anxiety, especially with COVID, she wants to have a drink. So we talk about pour me, pour me, pour me another drink. So that goes back to her cognitive thinking and her socialization from a long time ago. In group X, it's important, not that you really delve into somebody's history, but that you watch them. Body language is over 55% of communication. Are they a wallflower? Are they engaging? Is your exercise program too difficult so that they feel shamed and not good enough? Those are things that you need to look at, which means as a group X instructor, You've got a lot on your plate, but with the information that we're giving you guys with FAS and brain health trainer and behavior change and coaching, you know, you're in the right place and we desperately need you. Deb and I are getting old. We had the leg warmers and the thong, you know, leotards, and one day we will be retiring and we need people to continue the torch. So we're excited. 
So we know if you have FAS or phages, these are the foundations. Dan and Cody did a wonderful job looking at the functional domains. Please note functional domains are not this new functional training that's out there that is very dysfunctional because people's posture changes, they compensate, they, we can't do that. So we're gonna look at them scientifically. They've broken them down, I'm just going to read them quickly. Balance, mobility, neuromuscular, which does contain uh, lots of things of speed and coordination and body alignment, we'll talk about that later. Musculoskeletal, which is not just strength training cardiorespiratory, and the cognitive emotional that we're finding is more and more important. And as Deb said, with the social cognitive theory, all three interact and influence each other, as do all of these six domains that you will see. So we need to address all of them. They did an amazing job with this beautiful, this is the extended picture or roadmap of those six domains. We're not going to look at them or break them down now. We're going to take one at a time and we'll talk about a little of it. We cover them in depth in functional aging specialists. So who is Dr. Saad Nagy? We talk about the Nagy uh, disablement uh, structure, but in this slide, Deb was the one that pulled this out because we're talking about social as well. Yes, yeah, somebody can be physiologically disabled, but they also could be socially or emotionally disabled. So Nagy was an Egyptian born sociologist. He taught at Ohio State University and he was the one that actually came up with the framework, when is someone disabled? And he also has gone and worked with our government to find out when someone actually needs financial compensation for medical care or for just living expenses if they are disabled. So let's look a little deeper at this. So Deb talked about the environment and all the other pieces. So all of those come into pathology, which could be somebody's inactive or somebody has a pathology or disease, which makes them inactive. Then they get an impairment. One of those impairments would be found in one of those six different domains. If the impairment is bad enough, it will limit their function. And if their function becomes so limited and it stops them from doing things that take care of them and working, they would be labeled as disabled. So something to really look at scientifically. They also did a great job putting together what we call the hierarchy of functional aging. They only had like four different sections at the beginning, but then we said, you know what? There's a big diversity between fit. Is it fully fit? Is it kind of semi-fit? Certainly with independence the same, frail. You see one guy with a cane, you see another guy with a walker, and then certainly all the way to dependent. You also have your elite athlete, probably not gonna be in your group X class and unless they're just looking for some socialization and fun. You may have a diverse group from a pretty fit person all the way to a pretty frail person. Now, we're not gonna get into this in the last couple of years that we've taught, we broke these down and said, what were their problems and what do they need? Just know certainly that the further they go to the left, and the more frail and dependent they become, the less their cognition, the less their strength, the less their balance, and all of those six domains. When that happens, especially in group X, if you have a large diversity of group, you have to regress some activities for those that are further to the left and possibly progress some activities for those that are a little bit more fit and we've looked at various ways you could do it. Certainly going slower, but if you're working a balance or a heavy weight, that could actually make it harder, but other things definitely easier. Not super complex, smaller range of motion, not a lot of balance, not a tight stance, something that's a little more stable, shorter levers versus longer levels, again, less complex, and static, not moving a lot, not changing directions, depending on what's going on in that client. In your group X class, if you have a diverse group, 
you need to have specificity in regressions and progressions, which makes it harder for you as the teacher. But we believe you can do it. So when we look at different tasks that we want them to do in the class itself, a lot of these also deal with cognition. And Deb and I decided to apply the cognition to each one of those six domains. So attention becomes a big one. Now, our question to you as the instructor, will it always be auditory? Are always gonna be telling them what to do? Are you gonna show big cards? Are we gonna have uh, stations with signs? How are you going to do that? If someone doesn't see well, Certainly, yeah, and we have the giant cards. You can get them on Amazon. There are so many fun, cool things that you can do. Or are you gonna have external forces that are gonna be the task? Balls coming at them, bands, things that they're gonna to have to uh, manipulate around whether they negotiate it or, or actually you're reacting to a stimuli. Memory becomes an issue, and that's when you really go back to the progression and do some building routines, procedures, complex instructions or rules. We're gonna do some dancing later, a little choreography. And are you gonna have visual recall where you show them? Are you gonna have verbal recall where you tell them what to do? So best to mix it up. We tend to stay with one methodology when we teach, but we need a variety because people are failing in different areas of stimuli. Processing speed. How fast can we hear what you ask us or see what you want us to do and then react? Just remember, we're gonna show you some knobs in a minute. The more tasks involved and the more complex, the slower the processing speed. So this is when it is extremely important for you to decide what is the purpose of my activity? What do I want them to learn? Now you could use the same activity and have a different purpose and then just manipulate some of those tasks. So today, Deb and I wanna stimulate your, your curiosity, your creativity, so that you can be a better picture scientific, a better instructor or a picture so, <laughs> uh, scientifically. Certainly we get into executive function. Executive function is extremely important in the frontal part of the brain. It allows us to be independent. It allows us to reason and problem solve and organize and, and get to our homes and know where we live. So we want to stimulate that part of the brain, whether it be a little bit of mathematics or numbers or problem solving. Deb has a little problem solving drill a little later. Open skill, not always on a machine where you're having to move and think and react something new, something fun, something social, something challenging, but not frustrating. Once it gets to that frustration level, which will be different for each client, depending on where they are on that hierarchy, especially cognitively, you're going to have to regress it so that it's fun and challenging and they don't want to shut down. There are your knobs, the memory, the attention, the executive function and the processing speed. You cannot turn all those knobs up at one time. You can turn one up at a time. You can do a building phase where you turn one up then you turn another one up. And basically what we say is it depends on who shows up to that class that day, right Deb? Yeah. We're gonna take each one of those six domains and we're gonna start breaking them down. We're gonna look at the cardiorespiratory. So that was what was on that big map. Just because a person is old does not mean they can't do some anaerobic work or even some CP work. Now, it may not be at the speed that a younger person would do. I was researching the eldest Ironman. It's a Japanese gentleman, won the world Ironman competition for his age group, of course, at 85. He's 87 now getting ready to compete again. And those guys are out there for, and he's not doing it in nine hours. So he's probably out there for maybe 10 to 12 hours or longer. So just because someone is old, we put the CDC guidelines. I think that's important for you because we know our clientele 
is certainly not even getting the minimum. So it that hopefully is going to be a little boost for them, a little motivation, a little goal, but again, little by little, so that you're not going to overwhelm them. It's anything that increases your heart rate. We don't care what you do. And we'll be doing several different things to show you. We're going to give you the science and the guidelines. We're going to let you use your creativity. So with each domain, we're bringing in a little bit of a cognitive aspect. So the aerobic exercise does increase BDNF, the brain-derived neurotrophic factor. It is in the hippocampus and the temporal lobe of the brain. Not only does it deal with learning and memory, but it also deals with mood and emotion. And that can also come in with being motivated and having fun or actually being frustrated. It is a protein that promotes survival of the, the nerve cell or basically neurogenesis. So we can create the nerve cell, but will it grow, will it mature, and will it last? And that's what we want. So it is very, very important that we do cardiorespiratory exercise. And I'll give you another factor in just a minute. There are two factors that do promote neurogenesis. One is aerobic exercise and the other one is effortful learning. So not always just on a treadmill, haphazardly going along, but stimulating them cognitively while they're doing those activities. And it is important that we have that blood flow to the brain because relative to the other organs in the body, which was surprising to me, you know, reading the research, the brain does not get as much. So as we get older, because that is one of the aspects of one of the hundred types of dementia is a lack of blood. And we need that to bathe those tissues with oxygen, glucose, and other nutrients. So we say what's good for the heart is good for the brain. We're now into the part where Deb is going to be turning on her other camera. We didn't pick crazy, hard, difficult exercises. You can make these as hard or easy. That's where the progression regression comes. So we can either circle around or we can go inside and outside the circle. I, she's gonna be reacting to my auditory. So I'm gonna tell her where to go in the circle, what kind of step to do. And as she's doing that, I'm giving her some three and four letter words. She will spell them forward and she will spell them backwards. So Deb, I'm gonna have you side shuffle to the right, spell the word dog, forward and backwards. D-O-G, D-O-D. Good, now stop. I want you to go left, but I want you to cross over and you're gonna alternate like a grapevine and I want you to spell the word can, I can. C-A-N, M-A-C. Perfect. Now I'm gonna have you go forward into the circle. I'm gonna make it a little harder. You're gonna lift your knees and raise the arm and I'm gonna give you four letter words. Going forward and then coming back, Deb, you're gonna kick and push. So we're gonna do two different activities. So a little memory here, knees up, hands up going in, kick and push going out. Spell the word tree coming in. T-R-E-E-E-R-T. E. Oh, no, I messed up. <laughs> we'll talk about that in a minute. All right, let's try that one more time. Try the word rain, which we need in Florida. R. Good job, girl. All right, come back to your other camera. So Deb is going to also explain to you, Deb, tell them how old you are and one of your issues. So I'm 60. I just uh, crossed that threshold last October, and I am a two-time stroke and brain surgery survivor. Um, I have a brain disorder called uh, cavernoma disease, where the vessels of my brain, for some reason, um, misbehave, and when they leak and hemorrhage, if they leak, no big deal. Well, yeah, a little big deal, but if they hemorrhage, then it's another brain surgery. So again, 
my two brain surgeries and my two hemorrhages were my cerebellum. Uh, and so that affects, and you'll notice I will be challenged with my balance movements uh, because that is your balance center. I have a lesion in my frontal lobe. So as Di was saying, all this work is, I've been doing this type of therapeutic work since my first hemorrhage in 2000. So um, people look at me and I do an amazing job with the deficits that I have. And honestly, without this work, repetitively, I don't know if I would be half the person I am today. So thank you for um, mis my mis accepting my misspelling of tree backwards. <laughs> exactly. And so this is so great. So the age doesn't matter. Certainly you can take activities like that. If you have super fit people, man, they're going hard. They're running sideways and they're crossing over. And you could have several circles and group your people according to their hierarchy and their impairment factors and their six domains. All right, next slide. So now we're gonna work on musculoskeletal. As I said, people think like that's just strength. Well, when you look at this, Dan and Cody did a great job. The word above musculoskeletal is joint integrity. If you are not functionally staying within the kinetic chain and doing these things correctly, then you are not functional. You're gonna make yourself more dysfunctional. So in the strength, is it the eccentric load the person is having a problem with? I get this all the time. I, when I pull on the door at the bank, I end up in the bank. They can pull the door, but they can't control that power and that movement. And eccentrically, they don't have the power. So maybe doing a, a pulling with a tube and slowly going back might be something they need. It's not always concentric. What is their range of motion? I, I watch the older people working out in the gym without a trainer. It's like, you know, I always want to say, do you have a license to operate heavy machinery? <laughs> because they need one and we are that license to help them. So everybody always asks me, what's e-concentric? So e-concentric is a contraction where a muscle crosses two or more joints and at one connection, part of the muscle is doing an eccentric contraction and at the other end, it is doing a concentric. An example would be in a squat. So when you're down and you come up, your hip in the front is opening. So your rectus femoris or one of your quadriceps is stretching. And yet at the knee, because the knee is extending, that part of the quadricep is contracting. So you'll be having multiple, you'll have a concentric and an eccentric known as e-concentric contraction. So hopefully that takes care of that. Yes, we need speed. So if we want strength, we go slower. Speed must be controlled. And I know that being a martial artist, full speed, as fast as you can do it controlling your strength. So let's look at more of this. There are your CDC guidelines. Two or more days a week, that's all your muscle groups. So you're gonna have to figure that out. Uh, eight to 12 reps, we used to say one set was enough, but now we're saying probably multiple sets. And we don't care what you use, weights, body weight, bands, doesn't matter guys, whatever they wanna do. Four things you wanna ask your client. Number one, does this work? What you're giving them, does it work? You have to figure that scientifically. Number two, is it pretty simple? Number three, can they physiologically do it correctly? And the last and the most important, will they do it? That's your homework for them. Let's look at resistance training and cognition. I kind of talked a little bit about some of this when I was looking at aerobic exercise. So resistance training has been shown to help with executive function, which is very important with independence, function uh, and memory. Muscle mass stimulates IGF-1, the immune globulin factor one, which is linked to our immunity, which is extremely important as we get older, and especially brain health and brain immunity. It is an anabolic steroid that has been found to decrease with aging and has been found to be less in people that have cognitive impairment. So we know those two are linked together and we wanna stimulate it. The other thing that we talked about is effortful learning. 
aerobic exercise and effortful learning, which stimulates that cognition, which helps with neurogenesis. And research has shown because you're thinking about the muscle and the posture and what you're doing much more than a lot of times when people are doing aerobic exercise, that this can enhance cognitive function. So another selling tool why we want to do all of the six domains. Ah, so we have our next activity. Deb is going to be doing push-ups on the wall. I am going to give her variations of her hands, variations of her legs and her feet. We're doing them on the wall because everyone can do them on the wall. Certainly if you have a super fit person, boom, down to the ground they go. And all they do is change the vector angle, like if you're on a TRX. So, see, I'm trying to find her, but I don't have time. Okay. Um, so, Deb, hands on the wall. Let's go wide with the hands because we know if we go wide with the hands, then we're working a little bit more pec. I'm just going to have your feet in a comfortable position. And to make it a little harder, let's put your feet back, increase that vector angle. Make sure your hands are not too high because I want your scapula to be down. Now, as you do several push-ups, I'm going to give you a word and you're going to cognitively give me the opposing word. So the first, so go ahead and do your push-ups. Sick. Healthy. Hot. Cold. Up. Down. Stop. Okay, good. Now I'm going to have you put one hand slightly above the other one, and we're going to bring the width in a little bit, working a little bit more arm than pec. And I'm going to have you, so we're going pretty hard here, take one leg backwards and hold it up. Okay. In. Out. Happy. Sad. Sweet. Sour. Good. And stop. Nice. Thank you. Come on back and let's talk about that, how that felt and what your thoughts were. Okay. I don't know if anyone at home has had tried that as well, but you're going to see in other activities, the way my brain works is I like to speak on cadence. So it, if Diane would have said and directed me to do things like in between, the push or the pull or the pull away, it would have been more challenging. And if you notice when she said hot and I was into the wall, I would say cold when I'm out away from the wall. So again, that's just kind of that cadence and that rhythmical type of thing. You even might have noticed in my circle step, I was giving the letter as I was taking the step. So again, maybe it's my group X training of working on the beat, but that's kind of how a lot of my participants in my classes brains work as well. Yeah, and that could be a great progression once they get the activity to make them continue and to throw those, fire those things in a faster processing speed. Yeah, that was awesome. You're doing so well, Deb, your push-ups, everything. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. So now we're going into balance. And when you look at all that, it's like, whoa because balance is not putting someone on a BOSU. Now I'm not gonna sit here and trash BOSU, but one of the things that we have to understand is foot stability. And a lot of our elder clients have no ankle ability, calves are too tight and no foot stability. And the surface space on a BOSU is too small unless they're pretty good and they can stand on one leg, bada boom. So we need you to scientifically look at all of this. The guidelines are two to three days a week, progressively. Don't throw somebody in a certain thing until you've looked at the fundamental principles, which we're gonna talk about that. We don't want just static balance. We need dynamic balance. Most people fall when moving, not just standing on one foot, reaching up for something. Uh, challenge their center of gravity, turning. And the other thing to look at is, do they have some type of vestibular issue when turning the head? Do they get dizzy or some type of head dizziness 
with head turning, which is, you know, there are many, many different types of reasons that people have dizziness. So that also needs to be checked on as well. We want to move the center of gravity. We want to stress their postural muscles and do all kinds of things like that. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit specifically about some of these things. They're covered a lot more in the FAS. This comes from Debra, Dr. Deborah Rose's Fall Proof out of California. Your three balance centers, we are mainly visual dependent as humans. That's why we fall at night. That's why we fall when things get dark and we have pathology in our eyes. The vestibular system, the inner ear, which determines are we moving, is the earth moving, and we challenge that through head changing. Somatosensory is the bottom of your feet. You'll hear Dr. Emily talking all the time about doing things barefoot. When you put somebody in an orthopedic shoe and they already are diminishing those sensors on the bottom of the feet, we make it worse. So when I do a lot of balancing with my clients, uh, sometimes I like them to take their shoes off, especially if it's in a clean environment or have them do that in a one-on-one -on -one setting. You want them to be proactive in their movements, know how to do this, but sometimes reactive where you might throw them a ball or try to get their center of gravity off because that's usually when they fall is when they're you know reacting to something coming by. You definitely need some endurance, strength, and flexibility, some fitness. Your three postural strategies. Elderly people do not have that ankle movement. They don't use their hips to try to keep from falling. They try to step and they're too slow in their movement patterns. So we would actually work ways in fall prevention. And we cover that in FAS as well, or look up Dr. Deborah Rose fall proof course. There we go, sometimes we get stuck here. So the research is showing is that balance training is capable of improving memory and spatial cognition. Spatial cognition, how close is that object, some periphery, and basically figuring out movement. Also recognizing routes and remembering where you live. I have a client that has severe dementia. There are three condominiums exactly the same. If he goes out for a walk, he does not know how to get home because of those issues. Balancing is a way that can improve some of that as well as other things. So Deb whoop, is moving because we are going to do several things. I am going to have her do some dynamic changes of center of gravity in moving and then I'm going to have her being on one leg doing some alphabetic work and balance. Deb's going to talk a minute about her pulse. Oh, you're on mute. <coughs> that would help. So as I told you, I have some balances with challenge, um, sometimes the mobility issues that I struggle with. And so our good friends at Urban Polling, not sure if you saw Mandy's session a, a little earlier, um, but these are phenomenal aids and can be used as props uh, in a challenging environment like the one that I live in on a daily basis. So again, we have chosen to you know, use the Urban Polls in this activity just because we're working on mobility and balance. Um, and so again, a lot of times people say, well, what are you using? Where did you get these? So again, Urban Polling, they are one of the sponsors for this FAS Summit. So thank you again, Mandy Dye, for, you know, for uh, letting us use your polls in our presentation. Thanks, Dye. All right, <clears throat> so the first thing Deb is going to do is she is going to walk on her toes on the balls of the feet down. I'm only going to have her take, <clears throat> excuse me, four to six steps. Good. Now, when she gets there, back up just a little, Deb, for the camera. I'm going to have her keep her foot on the floor like a kickstand, and I want her to draw the letter Q with her left foot. This is where she gets into trouble. Now on the floor. So put it on the floor and draw it on the floor because it's easier to draw it on the floor. Good. Now I'm going to have you walk backwards on your heels, which is going to be really hard. And when you get there, go ahead. 
I'm trying without the polls. You're doing great, babe. <laughs> Good job. All right, now, so and, and look at the bottom, bottom one, because that's where her feet are. I am going to have you with your right foot on the floor, draw the word high, H-I. So on the floor, she is okay. Very, very good. Now, I'm going to have you do a step, shift, touch, step, touch. So you're going to walk in a slow-mo and bring the foot over and touch ankle to ankle. Very good. Her balance has improved a lot. Oh, my gosh. I had to do all the balance for it. Stop. Good. Now, in the air, and you may need the poles for this, you are with your right foot, you're going to write the letter T, something you drink, T-E-A. Good, so you had the poles on the ground and that helped you. All right, go backwards in a tandem walk with one eye closed. So you can see that she's popping those down just a little bit. Beautiful. And then in the air with your right foot, write the word car, C-A-R. Awesome. Come back and talk to us about that. That was tough. <laughs> that was tough. <laughs> yeah. Um, but again, I, lots of things going on, lots of firing in my brain, thinking about how to spell the word, how to maintain my balance. Like I said, I don't use the poles. Like I, you know, again, if we had a farther distance to walk, obviously I could practice a little bit more of the mobility and the gait. And even you can even get some cardiovascular uh, work, you know, poles, especially, you know, these Nordic walking poles, you know, you're using about 90% of the musculature of your body, integrating pole walking. And again, if you have the opportunity to, you know, get, I know that they have a certification program, but you know, it's all about, you know, uh, you know, the positioning and how you actually move. But for, for this purpose, for me, I use it as almost um, my guide wires. I use it as my training wheel. So I know it's there. It gives me some safety so that I know I'm not going to just totally fall over. Yeah, and the cool part is when we use training wheels for our clients, and I use all kinds of training wheels for them, you can eventually get rid of a lot of the training wheels, but it is a process and there has to be some mastery. Yeah. yeah. So this would definitely be a, a regression example that I just showed you guys. Exactly. I'm going the wrong way, baby. All right. I am looking. Oh, so we are going right into mobility. Mobility, gait, walking, crawling, going from a chair up, going from the floor to a sit, going from the floor to a stand, changing direct directions, turning and negotiating obstacles. Very, very important. And that is so that is definitely attached to balance because that's where people tend to fall. Deb did a great job. She put this slide in here for you. I'm not really going to cover it, but there is the uh, website to go to. This is a mobility test using different tasks and having some scores that you could do for, it'd be fun to do in a group X class. And, and you can use all this stuff one-on-one -on -one as well. That site also has a video, so if, if you're having difficulty understanding, you can watch the video to, to observe it. Perfect. Mm -hmm. And then, again, we're not going to spend a lot of time on, but we want you to step back and think a little bit more scientifically when you are putting together your obstacle courses. You know, how tall are the people? How good is their balance? How mobile are they? What's their gait like? How long can they stay on one leg when they're doing something? All of those things will change how high you do the obstacles and how far apart. So this is a study for you guys to look at. Certainly here you can see right, left, right, left. So they're continuing the gait movement as they're moving through these obstacles. 
the shorter they are so they don't have a lot of time to regroup and then step over certainly the harder it is or the more life activity it is however safety is a big issue when we're doing this if we have a very diverse group you may want to have several different obstacles that will deal with the hierarchy and the impairment factors of each client. So we really want you to do some scientific thinking about that. On our, and that was interesting, I guess I got rid of that. So on our mobility is Deb has put some ideas and we're also trying to show you guys, you do not need a bunch of crazy equipment. We pulled in some boxes. So, um, just some Amazon stuff that ends up on the door, just bring those boxes to class. So Deb has some boxes set up and she is just going to first step over some of those boxes. If she needs to use her little poles, she can bring those with her. Okay, take it away, girlfriend. Okay, yeah. yep. So what I'm gonna do is again, based on the information that we just learned about you know, about approximately that three foot step between obstacles. Um, I don't know if you guys go to individuals' homes, if you're doing small groups in other situations beside gym environments, but I like to ask people what they have in their houses. And I have, um, one of my clients has grandkids, so we use stuffed toys because they're always laying on the floor and we use it as an obstacle to step over. Another <laughs> thing is, <laughs> buckets that the kids play with in the sand. And so we use that as a prop. So again, like Diane said, you know, you can have all kinds of formal things that cost a lot of money. Um, however, I thought, you know, this year we'll show you guys how you can keep it low cost. Um, so I'm gonna just give you a demo of navigating through this obstacle course, and then we'll add a cognitive element, okay? So Diane, with this one here, we're just gonna step over with your little step touch. Right? Perfect. Here, circle around the stuffed animal, step over, step over, and then step touch back here. And then we would do the same thing and we would repeat it so that you would go in the other direction. That would be a left leg dominant on our step overs. And remember too, like if you're telling them what to do, that's a whole memory cognition issue. Then we're adding a fun social, more executive function because it's organizing, planning, trying to figure out things where it is team oriented. So you'll have teams. And so Deb has the, um, what is it called the four? We're, we're gonna for, do the puzzle one first. Okay, so she has these large puzzle pieces of the United States of America. So each participant will have several puzzle pieces that they can actually hold in their hands, which also creates center of balance issues. And then when they get to the end, they're gonna try to put those puzzle pieces into that puzzle that she has, which is really fun and challenging. And then if people are moving, you know, they have a couple of minutes to be there until it's their turn to go back. The other thing is four in a row, right, Deb? Yeah, so this one is this game called Connect Four. You can go to your dollar store, go to like, uh, sometimes I'll go to the Goodwill store in the kids section. And, uh, you know, I know when my kids got older, I gave a ton of this stuff away. Um, you can build Lincoln logs, you can do um, Jenga, you know, think about very simple, you can even add more cognition and do a game of Scrabble at the end of your um, obstacle line. So with the game of Connect Four, the participant at the beginning, of the obstacle course would be, let's say I'm on the red team. So I would have my red chips and so would everybody on my team. My competing team would have the black chips, okay? So again, going down through the obstacle course, navigating the obstacles as we discussed, and I'll meet you on the other side to show you, okay? So I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna go around, step over this, step over this, come back, let's say, here, I have the state of Texas. So cognitively, I need to know uh, Texas, South, West, stick it in, right? And if I'm doing the connect four, I know here, the goal of this game is to try to get four in a row. So you can see, 
Um, there's not four in a row anywhere, but I can start here and you can go it's just like, you know, a game of uh, tic tac toe. Exactly. Clear diagonal. Exactly. Any team will come down and they would do black. And so, again, just adding that opposite piece to. Awesome. Thank you, Deb. Yeah. All right. So, we're on a time crunch here, guys. We're rolling. Neuromuscular. So I had mentioned a little bit of neuromuscular that it's about motor control. You looked at the musculoskeletal and it talked about posture and alignment and those type of things as we do here. Reaction time is what we're going to be focusing on, especially with the cognition, that processing speed. That's what keeps us from falling. That's what keeps us integrated in life etc. So neuromuscular control is defined as the unconscious trained response of a muscle to a signal regarding dynamic joint stability. Remember, when, as you train, you gain. So if you know, you're know you humped over doing something and your brain goes, I got it. I got it. I know where I'm supposed to be. You have got to start breaking these neuroimpulse patterns that people have when exercising. And one of the big ones is scapula up. That's why there are shoulder problems and neck problems. So we're going to show you here when we talked about too much information, all right, TMI, look at the brains. You have a no contact control. They're not really doing anything. Doesn't take a lot of power and energy in the brain. One task, single task, Oh, you're getting higher. You got some yellow going on, and you've got multitasking. You've got orange and red. Boom! My brain is on fire because I am having to think about all that. And especially for somebody who has other issues, like Deb was talking about her balance and other issues. You know, you really have to think like them, not like us. So I think the more issues you have, the better. So Deb, I'm going to quickly put you in the middle. We're going to do some clock drills and we're going to work on multiple areas of the brain while we work processing speed and layer it. So we're going to start simple to hard. She is standing in the middle of the clock. 12 is in front of her. Six is behind her. Three is to the right and nine is to the left and the other numbers are in there. So Deb, I'm looking for speed, baby. I'm gonna call a number. You tap that number as quickly as possible and come back to center. One, five, 11, six, eight. Now I could do a memory thing. I'm gonna do several at a time. One, eight, 11. She hadn't lost it yet, has she? 12, six, four, nine. Beautiful. All right. So that's one way of layering it. Now I'm going to work a little bit more on your executive function. I'm going to give you a math problem. The sum or the answer, simple addition, subtraction, tap that number. Three plus one. Four. Six minus three. Three. Six plus six. Twelve. Twelve minus three. Nine. Beautiful. All right. Now I'm going to give you a number. You have to think, is it odd or even? If it is an even number, stay with the program, tap it. If it's odd or a little different, you're going to step over and step back. Do you understand? Yes. Okay. Two. Correct. Five. Yes. Seven. Four. Ten. Seven. Beautiful. All right, last one. I'm going to give you a math problem. Find the answer, decide if it's odd or even, and do the appropriate step. You with me? Got it. Two plus two. Four. Three plus two. Five. Twelve minus six. Six. Ten minus five. Five. Beautiful. Good job, girl. Come on back. And then Deb, quickly tell us how that was, and we're going to move right into cognition.
Last um, section. Well, just because we practiced on Sunday, I didn't matter today. <laughs> <laughs> and we really have not practiced a lot. No, so. but again, as you could, you guys could see the progression and adding the cognitive and layering it on top of the multi-dimensional type of tasking, that's where we could get a little tough. Yeah. It was great, a lot of fun. Awesome. So we're okay. moving it into the cognitive emotional. Final. And Yay. And we decided that dance movement therapy was just going to be the best. And it's also known as movement psychotherapy. So when you look at the module here, it's motivation and confidence, memory, a little bit of problem solving when you're thinking about where to go and what to do. And we're going to look at pain or pleasure when we look at music and other aspects. So some of the benefits here. Uh, depression goes down. It supports a lot of those brain functions. Memory stimulates nerve growth, increases coordination, and definitely improves fall prevention. So Deb put together, you have this on your PowerPoint, and you'll get the PDF file. And also at the beginning, Deb and I have our email. So if you guys have any questions, please email us so we can help you and answer all your questions. So you can Google these, you can tap on them, whatever, and you'll see the instructor explaining everything. Deb and I decided that we wanted to do the Macarena. Don't ask us why. <laughs> it goes back to our leg warmers. So I'm, Deb, go ahead and explain the dance quickly. And then I'm gonna put on some music so everybody can stand up where you are and let's dance together. And, and we have one little final thing and, uh, and then you're done with your Friday. Right, so again, thank you for sitting and tolerating the entire session. We know we've kept you a little bit longer, but if you recall the Macarena or if you've never done it, basically it's a right left type of a uh, rhythmical pattern so the palm goes down the palm goes down the palm goes up the palm goes up hip to hip when you cross over then it's back of the shoulder to back of the shoulder then it's did i do this no yes <laughs> yeah so head head uh-huh yeah head head and then uh hip hip hip, hip, hip cross over cross hip 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 in the front hip but, hip but, in the back yep Circle One, and two, three, clap and turn left. And turn left. Yeah. I need the All music. Right. I move on music. All right, baby. Now, right. remember, the music that goes into Zoom is just one thing. Just follow Deb. You should be hearing the same stuff. Hang on. Yeah, we're not going to do like all the minutes of it, but you kind of get the idea. I'm sure people have remembered and recalled that from dances and weddings and things. But Diane, it doesn't always have to be kind of a rehearsed choreographed, right? No. Tell us about that. So. <laughs> to finish us up. Okay. This is Betty. Betty is 94. She's been my client for over 15 years. She is a doll. She has a lot of joint issues. Had some, she's she's going to talk to you here in a minute. This takes about four minutes. Betty loves to dance. And one of the things that you guys have to remember about music, music stimulates pleasure. It stimulates motivation and positive feelings. So if you can do music, Betty and I don't do music because we just throw it in whenever, but music is great. So I am going to, uh-oh. Get it not in bed. Uh, I'm going to share sound. Aha. Okay, because I want them to hear this. All right, so I'm going to play this for you guys to hear and watch, Betty. Yeah, and if you guys need to leave, thank you in advance for joining us. You can use the chat box, but Di, this is you guys. 
everybody. She's one of my very, very, very favorite clients. I've been with Betty over 15 years. And funny enough, we do a little dance routine every time we get together. So I'm going to let Betty introduce herself. Betty is 94. Yes, I am 94. And I've worked with Diane all these years. And I can attribute my well-being at 94 to being with her and having her keep me moving. Keep moving is the key. Well, I also did have a problem with balance and uh, we worked with that uh, different ways for many years. Then we came up with this little dancer size because this way I, I practice balance and the kind of moves that you make all day as you're doing your duties, walking about, doing your chores. And it helps me to, uh, to, to learn my balance, shifting weight, turning, going backwards, making all those moves that you need to move, you need to do. And, uh, and I'll, I'll, you, I can exercise, do exercises, and they can, I can have pain along with them. I have no pain whatsoever when we do this. It, it, it does me a world of good. And I'm so happy we found this routine. Yeah, and Betty and I actually made up this routine together. Now, I'll be giving some cues, but sometimes, you know, I'm thinking about something else and I'll miss, and Betty will give me the cue. Yeah. So we're also working on cognition. So Betty's memorized this, and sometimes we do it as a warm-up. Sometimes we'll do it multiple times together for a little bit more cardio. Plus, we have a lot of fun, don't we? Yes, we do. Yeah, we have we a lot of fun. We definitely do. We're not even going to use music. I just do an eight count, and then we're going to get started. What do you think? Yes. All right, go. here we go. Five, six, ready, and step together, step. Step together, step. There we go. Now, single step. Two, Betty knows our eight count. Four, five, six, walk to the front. Knees up, kick out, march out, V-step, grapevine, right foot tap. Hands up, shake it out, left hands up and shake it out, mumbo right, left, right, left, step and turn. step, heel, toe, do it again, box, step, V step, back, I got it. Can I just share? I couldn't follow you the first time I did it. <laughs> That's a pretty long routine and she has it memorized. In fact, I was with her yesterday and I was thinking about this conference or something else. And she said, that wasn't right. And she, she told me the steps to do. So she I want to send, send her our love. She, she really 
brought a nice closure to everything that we talked about today, Diane. Thank you for sharing that with us. Yeah, and anybody that would like to write Betty an email, send it to me. She would love to hear from you. She was so excited about being part of this. So thank all of you. We hope you picked up some things that you can use scientifically, socially, emotionally, and cognitively. And had some good fun. Yes, always. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Deb, you hit the record button. Got it.